All right. Well, thanks, Didi, and Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And it's great to be with you from the holy land of Seattle, Washington, uh, where there's lots of rain and fog <laughs> and cloud. Um, special welcome to those first timers. I recognize some of your faces. Great to have you along. And uh, just to give you an explanation, we uh, basically go through the five books of Moses in an annual cycle. We've just finished last week Genesis, and we're beginning today the book of Exodus. We'll uh, unpack that in a few seconds. And we try to, um, you know, there's only a limited amount of time that we can study each week. And that's why we keep going around in cycles. Whatever the Lord uh, is speaking to us today about the passage, uh, maybe next year it'll be very, very different. But um, that's okay. It's like John 3.16. You can look at it. It can speak to you in one way today. And then in another year where you've moved on, you've changed, you're in a different perspective in life. It can speak to you in a, in a different way. So um, let me open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless and we thank you for this time that we can be around your word. We ask your blessings and your illumination as we uh, uh, open our hearts, our spirits, our minds to you, Lord. Pray your blessing on this time. In Yeshua's name, amen. 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 Okay, well, everyone, uh, today we're looking at Exodus 1, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, the book of Exodus is a big change from uh, what's happened at the end of Genesis. And I've called, not only is the name Shemot, which means names, and it's taken from Exodus 1.1, 1, 1, which says, these are the names of those that uh, went down to Egypt. Um, but I, I've given this a title today. The title that I've called it is God is with us and for us. God is with us and for us. And the reason why I've called it that is because what's about to happen to the Israelites, it, if you don't know that if you were one of the Israelites and you're about to get what is about to happen on you, it can really blindside you because this is the, the, the thing that happened. The, the height of the Jewish people living in Egypt with the reconciliation of Joseph and his brothers and his father, they came out to Egypt, incredible reconciliation. The, and, and one of the key things we talked about during the, se the, the series of Genesis is the maturing, the maturing of two uh, peoples. One was Jacob. Jacob went all that way. <laughs> There's about 20 chapters that are giving o given over to Jacob, where he begins in the womb as a trickster, uh, very competitive nature, and he's clutching at the heel of his brother. And then we speed forward to the end of Genesis, where he comes down to Egypt. His name now is no longer Jacob, it's Israel. Instead of taking, 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 he's now blessing. He, he becomes the, the, the giver of a blessing, the vessel of blessing. He blesses Pharaoh. He blesses his 12 sons when he gives them all a prophecy. He reaches to that high level of spirituality, which is prophecy. And so he is a transformed person. And then we see the transformation of the brothers. Look at how evil, absolutely evil they were. This is God's people, everyone. This is people in the house of God. You know, the sons of Jacob, and they were totally evil, where they, they plotted, they ruined, they destroyed the life of their brother, really. Or at least that, that's, that was, make no mistake, that, that was their intention. God, God's bigger than all that. God is with us and for us. Even when all hell uh, comes at you, even from your family and those close to you, where people betray you, God is with us. He's not blindsided. He is not thrown by anything. But sometimes we can be thrown. And the same thing is about to happen because it says that uh, I 
No, I'm jumping uh, uh, in page one of your notes or Exodus 1.8. Look what it says. There arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Okay. So uh, you've got, if you go back up the top of your notes, you've got this uh, people. Israel, only 70 souls came down in Numbers chapter 11. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, our, in our passage here in, in uh, Exodus, it says 70 souls came down to Egypt. So that, that was the beginning, everyone. After 400 years in slavery, and we're going to get to the end of, uh, uh, or at least uh, chapters 10, 12, the Exodus, it, it says that 600, approximately 600,000 came out of Egypt. So in a space of 400 years, you've gone from 70 to 600,000 a massive growth spur in, uh, in that time period. And that's only 600,000 men, everyone. You've got also women and children. It's estimated to be about two and a half million. So um, here's an interesting question. Very interesting question. When the Israelites were in Egypt, so the, the, they've come down and a new king arises, for the next 400 years, who knows? And we don't, we're not going to answer that now, but I want you to be thinking, what kind of religion did the Israelites have when they were in Egypt? Okay, there's no law of Moses that would come later. There's no New Testament that would come much later. What kind of religion did they have in Egypt? What kept them together? It's interesting when Moses... When the Lord appeared to Moses at the burning bush, which is in this week's parasha, he said, I am the God of your fathers. And pretty much that's it. That's the only hint what kind of religion they had for 400 years in Egypt. Meaning, I, I'm guessing the only religion they had is when they sat around their tables in Egypt and they talked about their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. What else? They had no written form of book. And they must have sat around telling the stories. Oh, you know, I remember my great grandmother, Sarah, you know, when she was she was old and she had false teeth and, uh, you know, she she could hardly walk. And God said to her one day, you're going to be pregnant. And she laughed. And I can imagine them all sitting around laughing about the story, you know. In other words, it was probably an oral religion, an oral tradition that they passed on these stories. I can't think of anything else. If anyone's got any insights, I'd be really open to that. In any event, what it does say in Exodus 12, 51, when they did come out of Egypt, it says, and it came to pass on that day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. Isn't that interesting? According to their armies. And I just think it's quite uh, profound that this time of uh, exile, what did God do? Because this is the beginning of the book of Exodus. It's really, we saw that last week at the end of Genesis when Jacob was blessing his 12 sons. He says, come and gather around to me and I will tell you about things that are going to happen in future days. And it was going to be an exile. It says that there arose up a new king who did not know Joseph. Now, let me make a comment about he didn't know Joseph. How could he not know Joseph? Possible. Everyone knew Joseph. He was the savior. He was the one that had the dreams. He was the one that told the, the Pharaoh, store up the barns because there's going to be a family. Everyone knew of Joseph. So I believe that that statement, he did not know Joseph, could mean a couple of things. One, it could mean that he didn't want to know about Joseph. He was done with Joseph and people. And this could be a, um, a, a literary phrase. It's like, it's like when, when Jesus said, 
you will, many will, will, will say on that day, we did this, we did that. And I tell you, I will say to them, I never knew you. Of course, the Lord <clears throat> knew them. Of course, he knows who they are. But this is a literary phrase. I never knew you, meaning, meaning I, 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 I kind of turned my, away from you, so to speak. So, of course, he knew Joseph, but maybe he got to the place where he said, I'm done with Joseph. I don't want to know about him. I don't want to know his people. Why would Pharaoh have done that? Because um, look at Exodus 1 verse 12. The more the, the Egyptians afflicted the Israelites, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. So the other reason why it, said, it could be that Pharaoh didn't, this new king did not know Joseph, is he, he was so threatened by him. He, in a sense, again, it's a literary term. Um, that he was like, okay, I'm done with these people. They are threatening me. We need to deal with them. Um, it's almost like when you do your gardening and you're weeding out the weeds, you know, you've got, you've got the beautiful weeds done and then you go back the next day and what's happening is new weeds. And in a way, that's how it looks like it was for, Far for this new king in Egypt. The more he afflicted them, the more he tried to crush them the more he tried to frustrate them, the stronger they grew. And guys, that's you and me. Because the enemy, that's if we don't give up. The enemy will try anything to frustrate us. Remember the prophecy? He will try and bruise the heel. The enemy tries to bruise us. He, he's, he's on our heel. He's on our tail all the time. He tries to afflict us. And I've used this analogy a number of times. <clears throat> Because don't forget, the enemy is always subservient to the Lord's will. That's how Judaism looks at it. There are two instances, one in the book of Job and one in Luke 22, where the Lord said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. And I believe when the Lord said that, that to Simon, he was referencing the book of Job. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But you'll notice in both of those books, the, the, the devil had to ask God's permission. Okay? That gives me a lot of comfort that whatever happens, even if it is the devil, uh, it doesn't matter because God is for us and he is with us and the enemy is subservient. And so... Um, and the other analogy uh, that I was referring to before is if you're, a, if you're a coach of a sportsman, let's say a boxer, and you want that boxer to grow and get better and get stronger, what are you going to do? Are you going to throw that boxer into a ring with someone weaker than him, with someone smaller than him? No, you're not going to do that. You're going to be a terrible coach that person is going to grow. What you're going to do is you're going to throw someone into that ring who's tougher, who's stronger, and who may even knock you out, knock you down, give you a bloody nose. But you've got that coach. He's going to, he's going to be right there saying, now get back up. Get back up. Keep fighting. You need a little bit of time out? Okay, take some time out. You need to get that, that bloody nose cleaned up? Okay, sit in the corner for a while. But get back up. I want you to fight. I want you to be stronger. And that's the picture we have here. Israel, after that 400 years, they didn't come out individually as the 70 people, the individuals. They came out as an army. Exodus 12, 51. They came out in their armies. They came out as a people. So the book of Exodus is all about going from individuals to a people, the people of Israel. From 12 sons to this army, this people, and the word Shemot, these are the names. God's got them all named, every single one of them. He's got a call for them. And that call is what? Is to bring them into their inheritance, to be vessels of light, to distill the darkness. That's the call on your life, 
That's the call on my life. Wherever God has planted us, we are individually named. These are the names, but we're also part of a community, everyone. We are part of the, the body. And there's a number of different names, by the way, of this community. There's the people of God. There's the church. There is the commonwealth of Israel. You Gentiles, you have been grafted in to the olive tree. <laughs> you, you are, you are uh, uh, partakers of the commonwealth of Israel. So many different names. We are the bride of Christ. So this is, this is our identity. And we have been called to, move, to let God bring the light into our lives. And then we do the same for uh, others. So the, the context, they're afflicted. Everything has gone from good to bad overnight because this king of, of Egypt decides this is not going good for me. This is a threat. And who knows what these uh, people of Israel may do. Maybe he had people in his ear, his, uh, his uh, enforcers saying, you know what? And maybe jealousy, maybe jealousy uh, rose up. Maybe it wasn't really among the king. Maybe it was his people around him that they became jealous. They became threatened. And they said to the king, hey, you better do something. We don't know. But the reason why we study God's word, everyone, is as we study it from a historical perspective, it's, it always speaks into our situation in life because we know that there are kings, presidents, prime ministers that change all the time, right? You may be happy with a leader right now and you may be, you know, he may be the person you voted for, but what happens if your nation votes for someone on the other side and someone you don't like and he rises? How does it make you feel? What's he going to do? Where is he going to lead our nation? And it can really bring fear, anxiety, um, uh, uncertainty to the, for the future, which is, is kind of almost natural and normal. But what do we do with that fear? What do we do with that anxiety? This is where we've got to learn from the Israelites. What did they do in this situation? All of a sudden, they're getting told to make mud bricks without straw. All of a sudden, they, 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 the whip is cracking. It's a tough time for the Israelites. And, you know, maybe that first generation, maybe it was the hardest for them because they had seen the heights of Joseph, of Jacob, and that 70 people came down. They're thinking, hey, we've got the Nile. We've got the water. What a bank, you know, because the water in those days, having the Nile, that's why Egypt were the superpower of the day, because they not only had the Nile, the water, because that water meant agriculture, and agriculture meant food, trade, and that meant weapons, they could buy weapons, and that meant power. On top of that, Egypt had a huge desert, so if you wanted to attack Egypt, it was kind of impossible, you had to get through all of that desert, so uh, if you were one of those 70 that went down to Egypt, you think, hey, man, it couldn't get better than this. Maybe maybe Miami, but here we'll take for now. And uh, they had all the water there. Uh, they were protected by sand, thinking this is going to be good. And all of a sudden, the whole tide turns. Okay, Kind of reminds me of the, the parable of the wise, the wise man and the foolish man. Okay? We don't know, everyone, when the flood is coming. We really don't know. We don't, it could be around the corner. It could be tomorrow. It could be a year. It could be 10. We don't know. But we got to be prepared. we got to get that oil in our lamps. we got to get God's word in us so that when the, the heat gets turned up, we know what to do. We know what, where we stand. We know that even if it is the devil, God is with us. And God is for us. Now, the other thing, before we go deeper into the passage, is going back to last week and the last few weeks where the spotlight was on Joseph, this messianic figure. I reference a number of times the, the Hebrew meaning of the name Joseph. In Hebrew, we say Yosef. And it literally means Yosef, God, Yosef, God will 
increase. Okay, that's what it means. God will increase. And that was kind of, you know, in the days of the Bible, the names of people were often connected to their destiny. There was something prophetic over those names. Yeshua, you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, which means salvation, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Yosef, God will increase. What happened, everyone, in the life of Joseph? God massively increased. First, though, Joseph had to decrease. That often seems to be the case, sadly. It would be good if God would just increase all the time. But there's sometimes seasons. And, jo and Yosef, he decreased. He decreased. He, he was like that grain. Remember his dreams? where the, the, the sheaves and the, the brothers and the father would bow down to him. Well, like the Lord said in, in John 12, unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it does die, it will bring forth much fruit. Yosef, he had to die in the ground, in the pit, in the prison all those years. God was faithful to fulfill the destiny and the calling in the life of Yosef. Now, guys, very important point. There's a big difference between what you think or where you think your life should go or what you want and what God wants. Okay? And this is the wrestle that we go through, like the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not what I want, but your will be done. And we've got to constantly, constantly, constantly soak ourselves in that theology, which is called the sovereignty of God over our lives. Okay. We want, we have dreams. We, we have, we have aspirations. We have things in our heart based on the ways of this world. And I'm not saying that they're necessarily sinful things, but they may not be what God has for us. For example, we may want a promotion in our, in our uh, vocation. We may want a, another story on our house. You know, we've got, we've got one story. We may, we may want two or three. We may want a better car. We may want to live settled on a, on a, on a beautiful uh, Mediterranean island. That, and, the, and again, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but we need to say, God, not my will, but yours will be done. And Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Okay, as long as we've got that at heart and keep going back to there, um, that way, what we're doing, we're giving room for the Lord to yourself, to increase in our lives. Okay? There's a couple of references about Jesus and about Samuel. And they grew in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God, and in favor with man. Okay? You've got the physical, spiritual, social, and mental growth. A good balance. He grew in wisdom, that's the mental, and stature, the physical, and in favor with God, spiritual, and with man, the social. A, a, a really good balance of growth. He was that they were growing, and that's what I'm saying. Yourself, God will increase, God will grow in our lives. This was Paul's prayer for the church at Galatia in chapter 4, verse 19. He says, My little children, of whom I travail in birth, until Christ be formed in you. See, Yeshua. He starts off as a little baby in our life and he grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And that's why Paul makes a difference between the basic lower gospel, which is Christ died for our sins, was buried and he rose again. But we need more than that. So He prays for the church that their eyes would be enlightened to the deeper, the deeper spiritual things. He calls it the unsearchable riches of Christ. And don't forget, when Paul was writing that, he wasn't writing it with a New Testament in his hand. He was writing it with the Old Testament in his hand. 
So that's where we get the riches, where we get into God's word and we see how Yeshua is the fulfillment. We see it in the life of Joseph. In the same way, Joseph was dead, buried, but he, God raised him from the dead and he made him the savior of the world. We see a picture of Yeshua, Jesus. He was crucified. He was rejected by his brothers like Joseph, but God raised him up and he became the, uh, our savior. So um, back to our text in Exodus chapter one and verse six, and Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. <clears throat> and we talked about how, uh, you know, Pharaoh did not know Joseph. He tried to break the spirits of the Israelites. He tried to break their spirit. He tried to push them down. And in, in Exodus 1 verse 9, he said to the people, behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them. Let's say multiply and it come to pass that when we fall out any war, they join also against our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they said they did set over them task masks to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Phetom and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them and the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children uh, of Israel. So isn't that great? Isn't that great? Again, seeing the situation that God is in control, they said, let us deal wisely with them. Okay? If you're in a situation where you're getting outwitted by someone, I wouldn't be discouraged, people. I would say, this is God's invitation for me to step up and grow in wisdom. Okay? If, if uh, whatever comes your way, don't, don't be discouraged. This is part of our discipleship. This is part of our training. And this is how the, the people of Israel grew wiser and how they grew stronger because there were people more wise and more stronger than them. So, and this is what happened to Joseph. Again, going back to Joseph, everyone, look at my notes in verse, page, uh, the page three, or if you've got your Bible, Genesis 49, 22. Look what happened to Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bough even a fruitful bough by the well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But look in verse 24. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, even by the God of thy father who shall help thee. And by the El Shaddai, the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies under, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessing of thy father has prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. What an amazing call. And this was... We, again, talked about this last week, Jacob's blessings on his 12 sons. And, uh, you know, a lot of those sons, he knew that they were about to face difficulties. But there was, a, can you imagine those sons when they left the room of Jacob? When they left that room after having received that blessing, okay, try to, try to recreate that story in your mind. They're, they, they're all standing outside. Remember those days that you got called into the headmaster's office when you were in trouble? Well, I, I remember because I, I was a bit of a stirrer. And you'd be waiting and then you'd go and you'd sit down and you'd get the talking to. And then you'd, you'd leave the office. So imagine the 12 sons, they're waiting. And they go in one by one to their father, but they're getting a blessing. They're getting this, their father lay hands on them. And then they walk out. They carry that blessing with them. I want you to, everyone, I want you to think of that. The blessing of the Lord is over every one of our lives. The ironic blessing, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. And uh, just the fact that we have the blessing of the high priest, our high priest, Yeshua, whoever lives to intercede for us. He ever lives, not partially. He's interceding he carries the 12 stones on his breastplate 
We are part of that 12 stones. He has us on our heart. Okay? Now, it doesn't always feel that way, especially if you've got a, a new king that rises up and makes your life a living hell, right? Doesn't feel that. And if you look at the natural sometimes in your life, you know, you, you wonder, and, and you turn and you say, Aaron, what are you telling me? God is for me? I believe he's with me, but he's for me? What are you talking about? This is a living hell. But what you've got to do, again, you've got to keep standing strong. Keep trusting he's working all things together for good. And this was the biggest lesson that you and I, the biggest takeaway that you and I can take from the life of Joseph. When he said to his brothers, you meant evil. They meant evil. No question. He said, I am Joseph, whom you sold into slavery. He said with a pointed finger, looking right in their eyes. You know, I mentioned this last week. Just in case you've forgotten, I remember you sold me into slavery. But God meant it for good. If you can embrace that verse. Guys, you may have been through hell as a child. You may have been all kind of abused, sexually, physically, emotionally. And uh, I'm not trying to minimize that. But God was there. He saw it. And if you embrace and let him do his healing work in your life, he can turn it for good. Remember that story I gave uh, about a month ago? I guided about, uh, I'm not going to mention names, but one lady who was on a tour, uh, she told me her testimony on the last day of the tour. She, she said, come into the lounge. I, I want to share my testimony. She told me that she, she was at, at home. This is in South Africa. And um, uh, with a number of her lady friends who stayed the night over at her house. And uh, that night, her servant, because in South Africa, most people have servants, um, not most, but a lot. Um, her servant's son came to the house with a gang of his friends and raped them all from, uh, from nighttime until the morning. They raped them, repeatedly raped them all night. And it's like, I'm sitting there and I'm in shock. And she, you know, she told me uh, how, how, you know, it was, it was pretty traumatic and her family, they, they found it even harder than she did. The Lord gave her so much grace to work through it. And she struggled getting to sleep. She still struggles getting to sleep at night. Just that fear that something could happen. But here's the, here's the, the redemption, everyone. Here's the redemption. As she has not allowed herself to get bitter, God has done an incredible healing in her life. And now, because in South Africa, rape, is a huge part of the culture. That's what she told me. I don't quite understand that, but it's rampant. She has an incredible ministry of reaching out to women, young women, married women uh, that have been raped and abused. And she can be that vessel of light, of love, of life to uh, so many that are wounded. So, guys, embrace that passage. Let God do that healing work. And like that song we had before, did you see in that song the water running, uh, flowing down the stairs? I love that picture. I'm, I'm kind of quite visual. And I just see that like from Ezekiel 47, which says, in that day, living waters will flow. And everywhere the waters touch, shall be made whole. And Yeshua used that imagery of water by saying, whoever believes in me, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Let those healing water. And that's a miracle, by the way, because living waters from Jerusalem, they were to go down to the Dead Sea. So if you have fresh waters, like the Jordan River, do you know that the Jordan River is living waters? They're fresh waters. They flow right down from Mount Hermon in the north, right through the three streams that most of us have seen, the, 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 the Banyas, Tel Dan streams, and they go down into the Jordan River. The moment they touch the Dead Sea, they become dead. They become contaminated. 
But this is the opposite. In Ezekiel 47, it says, everywhere that these living waters will touch shall be made whole. The waters will be healed. It's going to happen one day. And there'll be trees with leaves for the healing of the nation. There'll be fish, all kinds of uh, blooming and fruitfulness. That's what God did to Joseph. So he was so wounded by the archers, uh, Jacob said in his blessing, but his bow uh, uh, abode strong because of El Shaddai. So never give up, never be discouraged. And never believe that your healing cannot come, even if you've been struggling with, with mental and emotional struggles year after year after year. Keep opening up your heart to those living waters. Keep Stand strong. Keep trusting. And, and don't wait for the healing. Just keep moving forward and let God do it in his way and in his timing. Okay? Because it may be on a different timetable than we want. So in Exodus chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And there went a man of the house of Levi and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. And by the way, now we have the introduction to a new person in the story. Okay, Now we get to Moses. Okay. And in verse 2, the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months. When she could no longer hide him, she took him. Uh, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid in the flags by the river's brink. And the sister, Batya, this is, the sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to watch herself at the river. I'm sorry, uh, this is about you. And her maidens walked along by the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said her sister to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew woman, that she may nurse a child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, take this child away, and nurse it for me, and I'll give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it, and the child grew. She brought him uh, unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. So on the uh, two, two things, just a comment on this. Number one, um, she had compassion, verse six. When she saw the child, she had compassion. Uh, number two, the mother of Moses put Mo the baby, by the way, the baby didn't have a name at this stage. She put her baby into a little basket and she put that baby on the waters of the Nile. Now, guys, you know, you, especially you ladies, you, you, you have more of a, uh, an emotional attachment to, to children than men because you, you carried them in the womb. Um, and what a, what a, hearing what Pharaoh's doing, killing all the baby boys, what you got, you got a lose lose situation. One is you stick around and at the risk of your baby getting killed by Pharaoh. The other situation is okay, I got to trust the God, I got to put that child, I got to trust him and release him and, you know, uh, trust in the, the providence. Of God, and that's what she did, and uh, and that's always a challenge uh, for all of us, our fathers and mothers, with, with our children. Okay, as we pray for our children, everyone, think of this scene. Think of the baby's mother putting that child in that little basket and saying, "Okay, I don't, I'm, you know, I don't know exactly what she prayed, but uh, think of your children as you pray for them." Uh, release them into the providence of God. And that's what happened. God brought Moses, this child, into the providence. And now the last thing is verse 10. She called him Moses, Moshe in Hebrew, because she drew him out of water. Now, what's the connection? Because actually the name Moshe, uh, it's got nothing to do with uh, uh, drawing a child out of water. And I'm not going to go into it, but I wrote in our notes a little bit of the etymology of the name Moses. But 
What I will say is perhaps the writer of this story about Moses and perhaps the Pharaoh's daughter who called him Moshe did it prophetically without knowing that Moses' life would be connected with water. Now, that may be stretching a little bit. I don't know. But think about it. Moses' life, he, it was connected a lot of times with water. The, the Nile, for example. The coming through the Red Sea. The crossing the Jordan. The, the water from a rock. Moses would seriously have things to do in his future in regard to water. So perhaps without her knowing it, Pharaoh's daughter gave him a prophetic name, Moshe, uh, knowing that his life is going to be filled with stories regarding water. In any event, Moses, with his call, he started to fight it. Okay? Look at chapter, at the end of page five, chapter three, Moses fighting his flesh, his struggle. In chapter three, verse 11, Moses, who am I? By the way, this is in the burning bush, and we'll come back to that after. But right now, look at Moses' fighting. Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the, the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Sir, and, and the Lord said, certainly I'll be with thee, and this will be a token unto thee that I've sent thee. When you have brought forth the people out of, out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon the mountain. And Moses said to God, Behold, who will, uh, what will happen when I come unto the children of Israel? And they say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And then he remember his excuses. I'm slow of speech. I'm slow of tongue. They're a stiff-necked people. Okay? So here's the question. Here's the question. Was his complaining or was his struggle positive or negative? On the one hand, it was perhaps negative that he was looking at his limitation. Uh, sorry, that, that he, he wasn't just simply going in obedience. Like remember when the Lord said to Mary, you know, when the angel said, you're going you're gonna to be impregnated by the, the, the Holy Ghost. She didn't argue. She said, may it be so according to your sermon. She just said it. But here's the opposite. Moses is uh, questioning. What? How? Um, so on, on one hand, it might have been a negative. On the other hand, everyone, it might have been been a positive thing he might have been i've got a speech he had a stutter okay he was slow of talk and stiff neck people who would want to be the prime minister of israel today you know two jews three opinions four decisions uh very difficult people you always get people oppose you in Jewish circles and in Jewish families. It's just the nature of the beast. So, so he, he, he was looking at all these mountains ahead of him, and maybe it was a good thing that he was looking at his own limitations, his own weaknesses. In fact, three times, here's an interesting thing. In the middle of page six, there were three cases in the life of Moses that uh, he experienced oppression the first one is in exodus chapter 2 verse 11 it came to pass when moses was grown he went out unto his brethren and he saw their burdens and he spied an egyptian smiting a hebrew one of his brethren and he looked this way and that way and when he saw that there was no man he slew the egyptian and hid him in the sand so that's number one oppression he saw Number two, oppression, verse 13. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to them, to him that did the wrong, why do you smite your fellow? And he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And Moses was afraid 
and said, surely this thing is known. So number two oppression he saw when two Jews were fighting with each other, two Hebrews. And then the third oppression was at the well at Midian. Uh, now, when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now, the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. Do you remember that scene in the Ten Commandments? Cecil B. DeMille's famous Hollywood uh, movie, uh, Charlton Heston, remember it? He was sitting at the, he went to the well and there were the beautiful daughters and he came, you know, with his, with his oiled up chest in the, in the movie and he drove away the shepherds and, you know, they all fell in love with him. But basically the point here, everyone, is uh, three times he witnessed oppression and whether you agree with the way he went about uh, uh, dealing with it or not, I believe God saw his heart and he saw that Moses did not like oppression. He did not like to see people bullied. And this is the kind of man that God chose. Someone who saw his weaknesses, who saw his limitations, but who had a heart of compassion. Probably he got it from his mother when she saw, or his surrogate mother who saw the basket and, and she heard him crying. Notice it says she heard the baby crying and she had compassion. And maybe that was transferred over to Moses. May God give us a, a compassionate heart for all the tears, for all the pain that we saw, that we see around. Guys, this is part of our training. When we see the, the oppression, what do we do? Do we cut off the, 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 the bowels of compassion? Do we close down? We, we, we get tested on this all the time. And believe me, the tests are very little and they're very subtle. And God wants us to keep that soft, compassionate heart when we see un, uh, 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 unrighteousness and we see brutality and bullying. And here's something, maybe, Maybe God wanted Moses to know the feeling of pain. He wanted him to see this oppression. He wanted to see his brothers with that uh, affliction for him to feel, not just to see, but to feel the pain so that he could really be the true shepherd of Israel. It says, everyone, in, in Deuteronomy 33, there was no man like Moses, no one else until this day. Of course, we know that there's a greater than Moses, but in any event, um, you know, uh, and, 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 and furthermore, everyone, I think, and I touched on this earlier in the, in the study, when we have new leaders that rise up, not just in our nation, but it could actually be in our church, you know, how do we uh, deal with situations when new leaders arise? Uh, I, I think if we're true and honest to our own hearts, it can bring up a whole lot of fear, anxiety, angst, uh, uncertainty, all of that. We, you know, we, we don't know what, what kind of leader this person's going to be. Um, a new boss has just come into town. So, uh, we're, we're told not to be afraid. We're told to keep a soft heart as we, uh, as we have to face these new leaders. Now, Moses, I touched on this a few weeks ago also, when Moses died. Uh, I'm sorry, I touched on this a few months ago. Okay, I'm, I'm fast forwarding a little bit because at the end of Deuteronomy, where it says Moses died, and these, this is the life of Moses. And what I mentioned in the Hebrew, the word life is always in the plural. The only language in the world that the word life is a plural word. And what, what, what was the point that I brought out? I point, pointed out that Moses, like you and I, we have many different lives in the plural. Moses, you and I 
we go from infancy to learning how to walk, then we're kids, then we go to school, then we get a job, then we get maybe married, then we have children and so on and so on. They're, they're different stages in our lives. Okay? Moses was the same, but he had three main chapters in his life. The, this is the beginning of his first chapter where he uh, he grew. Actually, sorry, this is the beginning of the second chapter. Apologies. The first chapter was when he lived in Egypt and he lived in a, in a palace of luxury. He was the Pharaoh's son, it says in Hebrews 11. He was not ashamed to be called the son of Pharaoh. Okay, now is the beginning of a second stage in, in Moses' life. And I believe, I really believe, as I've studied this passage, I believe that this passage of his life began with trauma. And what do I mean by trauma? Okay, uh, that word may be a bit strong, but Moses, he had it all. He was, he must have been pampered. He knew the wisdom. He got taught the wisdom of Egypt. It was the most sophisticated culture of the day. Now he has to flee into the desert. He's got none of that comfort. He's gone from a five-star hotel to living in a tent. He's got no surrogate father. He's got no family. Food, where is he going to get food from? Where is he going to get drink from? Now he's fled to the back side of the desert. What a, uh, maybe it was a traumatic experience for him. Uh, in any event, he, in Exodus 3, verse 1, it says, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, He name me, here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I've heard their cry by the reason of their taskmasters. I know their sorrows. I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large, a land flowing with milk honey, falafel, schnitzel, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you that thou mayest bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he, certain, he said, certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token thee that I've sent thee. When you have come out the people of, e of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said to God, behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and they say, the God of your fathers has sent uh, and I say to them, the God of, the, of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Vayomer Elohim el Moshe, ehier asher ehier. Vayomer kol toma lebnei Yisrael, ehier shalacheni alechem. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said unto Moses, God said, moreover unto Moses, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. So let me just say a couple of words on that, everyone. As we draw kind of to the end of the, the teaching before we give a conclusion. Firstly, um, 
you know, Moses is, he's gone from being sent out on that basket from the heights of the life of Egypt. Now he's in the middle of the desert. He's going about his business. Kind of almost reminds me of Peter when he went back fishing, okay? And how the Lord came to him. And the Lord, in verse 7, I've seen the affliction of my people. I've heard their cry. I know their sorrows. Guys, it may seem like 400 years to you that the Lord has seen, he's heard, and he knows your sorrows. So take heart. It may seem that he's, he hasn't done anything. But we're going to see the glory of God. See? It's all about the glory of God here. He will be glorified in our lives if we trust him. So he appears to Moses in a different name here. We've already said, we've already seen in Genesis when we started our study in the book of Genesis, chapter one, uh, about two months ago. The first name of God is Elohim, which is the general name of the creator God. Then we've seen the personal name. Yahweh or Jehovah. Now we're seeing a totally different name of God. Ehie, Asher, Ehie. And that Ehie means I will be. But notice how God says it twice. Why does he say it twice? He, he could have just said, I will be. And that would have been enough. But he says, I will be what I will be. Some interesting rabbinical interpretations, everyone. And I think the best that I've heard is God, the Ehiya in, in the Hebrew, it's the all existing God, the all present, past, present, and future. Because in God, there is no difference between space and time. Okay? He's already in the future. He's already in the past. He is present with us now. Okay? But the twice mentioned, I will be what I will be. I heard one really in interesting interpretation. It's, it's, it's this. The way you look at God, the way you perspective of God is, that is how God is going to be toward you. Now, what does that mean? It means if you see God as a compassionate God, Ehiyeh, I will be compassionate. If you see God as a cruel God, that's how he's going to be to you. If you see God as a kind God, he will be kind. Now, I'm not talking about on your timetable. Okay, that's a different issue because his timetable is sometimes not ours. But Paul talks about this. Paul says to the merciful, he will show himself merciful. To the to the, uh, oh, I forgot. He, he, he lists about five or six different attributes. To the merciful, I'll be merciful. To the, 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 those who, and, and the Lord talked about this. Um, pray, uh, forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. Remember this thing that I've talked about over the last two years. Mida, neged, mida measure for measure weights and scales everything is as the lord said it, as you measure it shall be measured unto you so i will be how you see me and what we've got to do is we've got to see god the way the scriptures reveal not through our own mind and imagination remember the parable of the talents Remember, they all, one had 10, one had five. They both buried, they, they both used it and they were blessed. But remember the man with one, he buried it. And when the master came, what was his response? He said, I knew you were a hard master. You see, where did he get that concept from? He obviously brought it up in his own mind or imagination. And, and, and the manager said, because you said this. So be careful, everyone. And, and when I say be careful, don't let the enemy lie to you. You know, 
Remember when the disciples were on the boat and the, wa the waves were getting in the boat? What did they say? Lord, don't you care that we're drowning? You know, or another way of saying that is, you know, God, you're uncaring. You're uncaring. Okay. I used to struggle that. Okay. That's one of my confessions. I used to really struggle. And like actually a lot of Jews, we struggle with that. You know, I'm not going to believe in a God that allows 6 million Jews to go to the gas chambers. Why should I believe in a God like that? And for a lot of Jews, their God died in the gas chambers with the 6 million. They cannot get over that offense. So guard our hearts, everyone. And, and I would encourage if you're carrying that hurt, and to some degree or another, maybe we all do, I don't know. We had that little sense, a little bit of offense with the Lord. Um, hand that over to him and really let him heal that. I'm still working in that area in my own life. You know, God, why? Why do you allow certain things to happen? But we've got to somehow reconcile that with his goodness and with his sovereignty and with his providence that he is, not everything is good, but everything is working for the good. Okay, there's a difference there. He's not the master of evil, but he's the master over. Okay? Once again, there's a difference. So, guys, to conclude, the story today is there's a turn, there's a change in the winds. It's gone from the heights of Joseph and Jacob being reconciled with their father and their family, beautiful healing going on in the family to a new king rising up, a taskmaster who did not know Joseph. Time, the, 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 the temperature, the oven is going to get turned up big time, and it's going to be tough. They're going to be enslaved for 400 years. Don't forget, God prophesied to their forefathers, Abraham. Okay, And I wonder, everyone, when the Israelites were in Egypt for 400 years, I wonder when they did sit around the fireplaces with their, you know, ukuleles and, and banjos and harmonicas. I wonder if they did also bring that to mind, not just Sarah when she was an old lady laughing, but I wonder if they also did say, you know what, I think what we're going through here in Egypt, didn't God promise to our great grandfather Abraham that we're actually going to be enslaved for 400 years? Okay. Maybe I, I'm, I'm assuming they did because that's what the Lord said when God made a covenant with Abraham. Did it, did they let it discourage them? Everyone, this is our challenge. Whether we are going through good times, difficult times, whether we're in the boxing ring with someone that we're beating up at the moment, or whether we're being beaten up, we got to keep getting up. We got to keep fighting. We've got to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And Paul actually says we are to pray for these leaders. If we're facing oppression, if we're if our president is not the president that we want, we pray, we keep praying. This is part of the, 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 the catharsis that we go through instead of let, letting it, you know, uh, enrage us instead of allowing it to poison us, we got to give it to the Lord. We got to pray. That's why the Lord said, Bless those that curse you, pray for those, pray for those leaders. Because three things, everyone, three things that we see in this story is that if you look in Exodus 3 20, with the challenge that face that. Moses and the Israelites are about to face. And this is jumping ahead a little bit to the Exodus. In chapter three, look what the Lord says. And this is the beginning of the, the real battle. I will stretch out my hand and I will smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. Number one lesson is God will judge the oppressor. He will judge. He's going to judge Egypt, okay? So God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows, number one. Number two, God will give 
favor. God, actually, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Number one lesson is it's not going to be easy. Okay? Not always going to be easy facing life, and it's difficult. Number two, God is going to bring judgment. And number three, God will give favor. Remember when Joseph was in prison? It says the Lord was with Joseph. And here at Exodus 3.21, I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourns in her house. Jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment. And you shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters. And you shall spoil the Egyptians. So number one, it's not going to be always be easy. Number two, God will bring judgment on any oppression. And number three, I will give favor. Guys, the name of the, 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 um, the lesson today, Shemot, which means these are the names of his people, the sons of Jacob, the name of Joseph. I will increase. God will increase. Is God increasing in your life? Are you growing in wisdom? Are you growing in stature? Since I've been here in the United States, I've eaten so much, I can tell you I'm growing in stature already. And are you growing in favor with God and with man? And Moses, drawn from the water, his prophetic name was that he's going to be involved in stories of water, providing spiritual nourishment through the rock that he would speak to, that he would strike. And guys, no matter what happens, the, the, the title that I called the study today, God is not only with us, but he is for us. There's a difference. We know mentally he's with us, but sometimes our circumstances, it doesn't feel like the blessing of God is over our lives. It is over our lives. Don't look at the circumstances now if you're not experiencing them. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Because even 2,000 years ago, when Yeshua came to this earth, the angels were celebrating. Mary was magnifying the Lord. Okay, the disciples, they met the Messiah. Great. Doesn't mean that their life was going to be a bed of roses. They were going to remain under the oppression of the Romans for a long time. So think of, but, but the, the message of, of, of good tidings, guys, is a message of peace. The Lord said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Yeshua, the one greater than Moses, that Moses prophesied in Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, the Lord your God will raise up unto you one like me. Listen to him. He is with us. He has the living waters flowing through him, and he lives in us. He's not only with us, he's for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Thank you and amen. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aharon. That was wonderful, as always. Um, and when you were talking you. about affliction, uh, I had done a study. I read on Kabad.org. That's a, a Jewish site, in, in case people haven't heard of that, um, on this particular Parsha, that when the Israelites were enslaved, they were building Pharaoh's storage houses, right? And they had to use bricks. And, and I can't do it justice. I mean, it was rabbis use a lot of words, right? It was pages. And so, um, but they were talking about the mortar and the brick and the straw and, you know, all of that. But when they build God's house, they use stump that was provided by the creation and by the creator. And so I just did a little quick study, and there's only nine references to brick in the Old Testament. There's 128 to stone. And in the New, I could only find uh, no, actually no references to brick, and there were 48 references to stone. You know, and, and the question was like, are, are we building Pharaoh's house or our house 
like material things, like you talked about the second story on the house and, and all of that, or are we building God's house? You know, like when they were building the temple, you know, it was with the stone and um, cause yeah. we labor and we labor um, when we build our house and not that we don't labor for the Lord, but it's a different kind of labor. Yeah. And uh, you know, Jesus is the chief cornerstone, not the chief brick. <laughs> Yes. So it's really interesting. Um, you know, I probably got to that, but if you're interested, no, Paul, go out to Kabad. Paul, Paul actually touches exactly on what you're saying when he says to the church at Corinth, be careful what materials you build with. Because he said if you use gold and silver, they're gonna they're gonna last. Mm. But if you use wood, hay, and stubble, they're gonna be burned up. So um the other thought about that, um and we, I think I touched on this a, a few months ago when they were building the, the Tower of Babel, they actually took the natural elements of God's creation and they changed those elements and used other elements as they changed it. And I've been reading a number of articles of what's going on in our day in the 21st century, how some people, and I can't quite remember some of the examples, but they are, well, uh, you know, even using man, uh, even using things to make a drone, ma uh, not a drone, a, cl a clone, making human beings out of the natural elements that God has given us, trying to change God's creation. Paul deals with, with this in Romans 1, uh, even worshiping the creation rather than the creator. So um, when you see people playing around with God's creation, Pay attention. Be careful. This is going to be, I believe, one of the signs. Because the Tower of Babel is where they built their way to God. They said, let us make a name for ourselves and let us build our way to God. So, yeah, good point. Thank you. Yeah. And that didn't go so well for them. So <laughs> It did not go. It, no, it, what did it lead to? Bavel. And in mm -hmm. Hebrew, Bavel is Babel, which means mm -hmm. confusion. Mm -hmm. And exile, right? They and exile. That's right. Yeah. I was very heartened that you should start off with um, God is with us and for us. In the Anglican liturgy, which I follow, um, in the communion service, it says for us men and for our salvation. So before we had salvation, God is for us for us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven and remember in the pandemic <clears throat> there's much use in song of the aaronic blessing and it was all around the world and after the, the actual prayer there is always this repeated refrain he is for you he is for you he is for you it was it was wonderful and he still is <clears throat> amen thank you jane Yes. Amen. Some of that let, let, uh, Anglican liturgy is filled with deep truths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think God likes, uh, God even loves Anglicans. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Aharon. Uh, when you were talking about Moses and you were talking about him being put in the waters and how water was a lot of his life, what God used water in, it, it just shows me the earliest uh, illustration of a mikvah because these were all living waters, you know? So he was drawn out of the water as an infant put in the water, drawn out of the waters, he struck, to me, it all points to living waters and the earliest illustration of the mikvah. And it's amazing because uh, we, had a, we had a teaching in church and I mentioned mikvah and this is not a term or an understanding that people in church have. They understand baptism, but they don't understand the precursor which is even shown in the Old Testament about washing yourself and washing your clothes. So they don't understand the idea of going from an impure state to a pure state and, and they don't understand clean, ritual cleanliness 
and a mikvah is is like a precursor to baptism, mm -hmm. which is the cleansing from sin. Wow. Mm -hmm. Love it. I love uh, that insight. Bible, uh, a quick question. Uh, and uh, I remember the, the source. Doesn't the Bible equate going through the Red Sea with yes. baptism? Yes. Yes. So, so, so how much of Moses' interaction with water ties back to baptism? That's an interesting question, an yeah. interesting thought. Mm -hmm. That was wonderful, Chris. It was. And yeah, see, it, it all depends on, on how our, what is our mindset in the 21st century of that word baptism? What does it really mean? You know, maybe if we all, had a, a sentence we'd come up with completely different ideas certainly certainly what chris was saying the word mikvah uh, that that sense of getting cleansed getting immersed getting washed um even though it's physically outward it's as it's kind of like when you when you have a shower or a bath you know it's our word but it really can do something special from within it there's a there's a feeling of being cleaned um so but when you get to the second temple period or around paul's time that word baptism also in the culture of the day had co strong connotations to the word identification what do i mean by that i mean that if you got in fact paul uses this as an illustration of first corinthians 10 he says, do you not know that they that came out of Egypt were baptized into Moses? Another word for baptism is immersed. Okay. And the idea is when you joined a movement, whether you join the Pharisees or the Essenes or the Zealots, it was part of an initiation rite that you would go into a bath, you'd go into a pool, and it was part, you'd be you know, washed, and now you are identifying with that movement. Now you come out of the waters, not only are you clean, but now I'm a member of that, I'm identifying with that movement. And mm. Paul mm. uses it when we follow Yeshua. Yep. That we is the baptism of John. Excuse me, that's the baptism of John. That's why the Jews were getting baptized by John. They were identifying with the That's beginning right. of the new movement that Yeshua was coming and they had to be cleansed of all the old uh, mindsets that they had yes. because he was going to really rock their world. Mm. And the only, problem, the only problem with that was like, remember when you converted to Judaism, you went through the mikvah and you came out a, a new person. You came out a Jew. And I think they must have applied that when people went through baptism, when Jews went through baptism, that now they became something different than a Jew, but they didn't. Mm. They were still Jewish. They were supposed mm. to still be Jewish, not Christians. Maybe that's yeah. why there was the complaint of we're the sons of Abraham. And uh, yeah. John said God could make these stones, the 12 stones that were in the river of Jordan, the sons of Abraham. Yes. Yeah. But didn't John say that this is this particular baptism is the for forgiveness of sins? Um, no, I don't think he actually said that. I, 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 well, he was connecting them. Yes, but I, I, I read into that he was, was more of a preparation. Um, yeah, no, I think you're right, Jane. It was for the forgiveness of sins, but, um, but that was an ongoing annual thing, forgiveness of sin. That was yes. an ongoing thing. But going back to, um, going back to the, the, uh, what Paul teaches about being baptized in the name of you know, Yeshua, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, is I think what Paul is saying is that when you get go under the water, you're identifying with the death of the Lord. You're 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 dying with him. Exactly. You're you're being buried with him. 
and and see this is a very spiritual thing and then when you come out of the water you are being raised up as a new person in him and when you are ascended out of the war you are being ascended up to the heavens in a in a uh, in a new way so it he, ta- he definitely you know we've talked about this the different stages of spirituality look at the the end of the life of jacob he had ra- risen up and joseph as well both of them had risen to such deep spiritual levels uh you and i we are on that journey where we are growing in the spiritual realm so um it's it's an ongoing process and and that's why uh, we we are to uh, really i think whether we do it physically or whether we do it by faith but we're to identify with his death every day paul said i die daily so yeah yeah baptism is very very important immersion because like you said we die with yeshua and then we rise with yeshua as a new creation repent even in acts 238 says repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of yeshua hamashiach for the forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of the holy spirit that's when you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the immersion, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I believe. Very important. I have Thank a question, you. Aharon, to you. Um, yes. When you had mentioned, um, you know, Moses not being named, and you also mentioned the movie, which made me think of, you know, we had been taught a lot that Pharaoh's daughter knew Moses was a Hebrew because of the cloth he would have been. Remember the movie? <laughs> he would have been wrapped in the, the Hebrew cloth, but... <laughs> As a Jewish boy, he would have been circumcised. So she would have known by that. And then at his circumcision, would his father have given him a name? I mean, he wouldn't have had a name that Pharaoh's daughter would have known about. He would have been nameless to her. But was it the custom to name the child? It's a good, really good question. Hmm. yeah i mean it is today and, and we know that that custom has been around since the second temple period but whether or not it happened at the birth of moses is a really interesting question mm-hmm. the author uh for some reason or another hasn't given us that information mm-hmm. we don't have that but it's a really interesting yeah. question and maybe yeah. she wouldn't since she didn't feel like she was going to keep him so i don't know maybe maybe yeah <clears throat> No, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, Jesus himself uh, in John 3, it said, Yeshua answered and said, Amen, Amen, I tell you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Um, Do not be surprised that I said to you, you all must be born from above. And he goes on, he's talking to Nicodemus, you know, and goes on to tell him, when Nicodemus questions, how can I be born again? Uh, can I enter my mother's womb again? And, and Jesus says, no. But, you know, just like the song that we played at the first, Jesus is our living water. He Amen. comes to us and fills us, just like Gary was saying, with the spirit uh, when we're baptized. And uh, baptism is nothing to be... Um, kind of sloughed off in my opinion uh just like the mikvah that when that happened and and people would cleanse themselves before they went into the temple or gather yearly to do that uh it's very important not only as an identification to uh people folks that maybe come to see us be baptized but also for us uh to have that once again renewal Uh, a recommitment, you might say, uh, for a mikvah, which I believe, you know, we should all do. Amen. Can I I stir the waters a little bit here? I'm remembering the story of Bathsheba bathing on the roof. That Mm. was a mikvah. Mm. And it was a mikvah after a a monthly ritual for women to be in the mikvah. I've heard it poorly taught that it was a setup, that she was naked on the roof to entice him, blah, blah, blah. She was there doing what all Jewish women did. 
And when David took her, he I think he must have known as an adult man that this was going to be the time that she would conceive, because that's what happens when after this period of time when you have a mikvah. I wasn't trying to get too, you know, whatever graphic about it, but I'm saying it puts a different slant on that whole story of David and Bathsheba. What do you think, Aharon? Uh, and that's the first I've heard of that, uh, Chris. I think um, I'm I'm not gonna I'm I'm not totally convinced about that 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 was a mikvah bath that she was taking. I'm not, but it could be. I'll, I'll look into that. Uh, it certainly is something to think about. And it makes sense that if it was at that time that when she you know when she would be you know the the although on the other hand you would think that he wouldn't want to get her pregnant because he, he didn't want any evidence that he took her. So I don't know, but it's something to think about. Yeah, good, Chris good, just good wanted, thought. Chris just wanted to stir the mick for water. That's all. <laughs> yeah. He was a man. Yeah. He probably wasn't thinking about that. <laughs> he was thinking <laughs> below the waist, not above yeah, yeah. the waist. But I think that's an amazing point, Chris. It's a very Jewish, you know, way to look at that. Um, which of course they're Jewish scriptures. So, and talking about the first, uh, first one in the stirred up waters gets healed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, <laughs> also, talking about the naming of, there was a lot of times in the Old Testament that God named the baby. God named Ishmael. Yes. God named Isaac. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, God would tell, um, I think it was um, Jacob, you know, what his children would be named and why they would be named that. So, uh, yeah, good it's point. Very interesting to think about names. It is. Yeah. Um, on a different note, this is Chet. I just wanted to make the observation as you were talking, uh, Haron, about the um, about <laughs> what religion the Jews practiced in um, in Egypt. Uh, I, I think just like in, in, in modern day, certainly in America, I assume you guys have them over in Israel. They had little bracelets that said WWJD. Oh, yeah. What would Jacob do? Mm. <laughs> yeah. I love that. <laughs> yes, that, that would fit. That would fit the day and the culture and the context. Thanks, Chad. It's yeah. good. <laughs> Uh, anybody else? Gary, do you have anything to add to uh, what I, you've I, already put in the chat? Or? Yeah, I actually do. Um, I want to emphasize what Aaron was speaking about because I think I think someone here needs to really hear it. But uh, yeah, God is not only, not only with us, but he is for us. And there is so much that we could take the story of Moses' progression and, be, and actually becoming a leader. He was not ready for leadership overnight. Likewise, we may understand that we have a calling on our lives, and this might become evident time and time again, but we must wait for that time when the Lord chooses to release us into the fullness of our destiny. As well, we might also feel incapable of accomplishing anything for the Lord, having lost much of our self-confidence through the trials and tribulations of our lives. So whatever our experience, it still remains true that submitting to God's presence and following his direction is all we need to fulfill his destiny that he has assigned to us. We can also learn from the sufferings of the Israelites. Despite the tyranny forced on them by the Egyptians, the people of Israel still grew mighty in number. And oppressive circumstances cannot prevent God from carrying out his purposes and fulfilling his promises. We might suffer under some sort of bondage or pain for what seems like a very long time, but we can be rest assured that God hears our cries. He remembers the covenant we have through him, through our Messiah Yeshua, which provides a way out of our spiritual bondage into our actually our inheritance, but we just must accept it. Through God, uh, though God is true to his promises, we still need to keep crying out to him for deliverance and waiting in faith and hopeful expectation to move on our behalf in our spiritual and our earthly afflictions. Actually, we know that God is not deaf nor aloof to our suffering. His arm is not too short to save. Psalm 34, 17 says, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them, he delivers them from all their troubles. And um, the last thing I want to say is sometimes when God is preparing to do something great and mighty in our lives, the situation can worsen for a time. As we move toward our destiny, Pharaoh, 
represents those who oppress us, even Satan, the spiritual enemy of our souls, who resists our freedom with all his might. But in such circumstances, we should not give up our faith. For in due time, we will see God's mighty hand and outstretched arm deliver us in his perfect way in time. Psalm 12, 12 says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. In these last days, as Israel is beset by those who desire to destroy her, it may seem to them that peace and deliverance is lost. But as written in Romans eleven twenty six, 26, in this way, all Israel will be saved. As is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godly, godlessness away from Jacob. So not that Israel is, is so perfect and so righteous, but God will make them that way. And the righteous in Proverbs 10, 30 says, the righteous will never be uprooted, but the wicked will not remain in the land. And that's for, that's for the people that want to destroy Israel and want to take over the land. Proverbs 10, 30 is a fantastic scripture for that. And I'll say it again. The righteous will never be uprooted, but the wicked will not remain in the land. And that's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Wow. That, is, that was fantastic, Gary. Well said, well put, beautiful. Um, and uh, one addition is don't forget, everyone, that when Israel came up out of Egypt, they came out as an army. Okay, They weren't just an individual. They came out strong. <laughs> they came out uh, as, a, as a fighting army. They learned how to fight. They learned how to overcome the difficulties. Of course, they had their issues still. They, they were a bunch of complainers and whiners. Um, but uh, God had a purpose. And uh, it definitely shaped their character being under that or in that furnace of affliction. So don't be discouraged. Hang in there. Be encouraged and encourage others. You know, I'm sure we've got at least a few people in our circle of friends or life that need encouraging. This is our call, everyone. Be a Moses. Be a Joseph. Encourage those that need it. Yeah. Amen. 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 Well, thank the, you, Aharon. Um, it was wonderful. Where are you off to next? Are you staying there for a little bit? Yeah, I'm going to be um, tonight. I have uh, a meeting with the leaders of the church. And then tomorrow um, I'm going to be in uh, the church in Seattle. And then I'm leading two, even though it's not Passover, I'm going to be leading two Passover meals. They want you know, me to explain what it is, how yeah. Yeshua, how Jesus is the fulfillment of that. And there's, there's going to be about 400 people at each. So it's a, a decent wow. size. Um, and then uh, and then there's something in the evening as well. And I forgot. And then I'll be uh, for a couple of days um, where, where our, my hosts, are, one of my hosts are going to take me a little bit of sightseeing just to have a little bit of fun. <clears throat> Maybe even... Uh, snow snowboarding i think it's called so oh we'll see outstanding oh, okay <laughs> he shall not suffer your foot to be moved aaron <laughs> i'm gonna claim that jay I'll bring thank it. You. <laughs> but we'll be praying for you and definitely we thank bless you. you i bless you before thank you uh gary we turn it over to you and gary but um definitely want thank to personally you. bless you and, appreciate uh, that Thank so, you, everyone. Let's let's. What's that, Gary? I was going to say. So we can't. We we won't be able to see you, Dee Dee and I, uh, or um, you know, since you're going to be so busy, maybe you can send us some send us some harosit, will you? <laughs> All right. I will. I will. I'll, I'll try to say some up here. All right. Okay. Good, well, everyone. Go ahead, Aharon. Uh, being with us, and uh, let me close in a word of prayer, and then Gary will close with the. Uh, blessing us. Father God, we do thank you and we praise you that you indeed are not only with us, but you are for us. You're working out all things for our good. And we know part of that good, Lord, is to help us to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with you and with man. And we do pray, Lord, that we would understand the times and the seasons that each of us are going through, um, that we would not fight that we would learn to rest 
in the midst of it and to trust you to raise our spiritual uh, minds, our spiritual eyes above our circumstances so that we walk by faith and not by sight and that we would grow and more and more and that you would grow in us too, Lord. I bless everyone and I thank you for them in the name of Yeshua, Gary. Amen. Can you all please unmute? So if you want to agree with me in prayer at the end, you're welcome to. Oh, uh, uh, hang on one second, Gary. We had some new people here that I don't have email addresses for. Yes. Um, I will put my email address. Well, that's not going to work in the chat. Give it to Aharon and he can send it uh, to me if you want to get the recording from today and an invite. Um, for the next week so sorry and, and and usually we send out the the notes a few a day or two before the study yes. to to help you prepare thanks Didi. yes gary Amen. thank you so much i always share a little bit since you have such new people in hebrew behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers and sisters mm -hmm. to dwell together in unity and we, we, I love this, these sessions, Aaron, because there's such un unity here. We love the questions and answers, banting back and forth. It's just, it's just really good. And we, I thank you so much for Excellent. that. Excellent. Praise yeah, the Lord. So we receive the blessing of the Lord. Yivarechicha denai v'nish merecha. Yair denai panavalecha v'chonecha. Yisai denai panavalecha v'yasem lecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon each and every one of you and fill you to overflowing with his everlasting peace. B'shem Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of our Lord, Jesus the Messiah. Adonai our Lord, Moshenu our Redeemer. Pelio X, wonderful counselor. El Gibor, mighty God. Aviad, everlasting father. And Sar Shalom, the prince of everlasting peace. And all of God's people says, Amen. 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 Yes, we'll see you in February. And um, and a special thanks for those first timers that have come uh, mm -hmm. from Michigan. You know, everyone else, you know what I called them on my tour? Because they're from Michigan, I called them Michiganers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for those that don't get that, that's a that's a Yiddish word, which means crazy, but in a fun way. <laughs> and 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 uh, it was great to have you along. And, uh, yeah, and everyone else, great to see you. And uh, have a wonderful Shabbat or whatever you're doing today. <laughs> and uh, love to you all. The blessing of the Lord be with you and. Thanks for coming. Bye. 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 Bless you. Bless you. Bye. Thanks. Bless you, everybody. Bye. Bless you guys. Bye.